A story was told about three persons in a mental asylum having a conversation. The first asked the second, who do you say I am? The second person replied, you are Adolf Hitler. And the, the first uh, person responded, who told you that? He then said, God told me. Then the third person who has been quietly listening to the conversation quickly weigh in into the conversation, telling, this, telling off the second person, no, I did not tell you this. The title of the message today is, Who Do You Say I Am? The Enduring Legacy of Jesus Christ. This is based on Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 to 20. In verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed not by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I'll give you the kingdom key, keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose will be loose in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the church into an unprecedented terrain, breaking through many traditional frameworks and possibly creating new norms into what constitute the practice of church service, congregation and community. More than just the practice of the church, this uncharted path brought about a certain level of rethinking about what church really is, especially in the light of the growing platforms of doing church online due to the constraints imposed by the pandemic. And it's timely then to invite you to endeavor in this whole journey of retracing and rediscovering how the notion of church was first conceptualized in the Bible. And the word church was mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 in his conversation with his disciples and in particular, Peter the Apostle. The Greek word church is in the passage is Ecclesia, uh, and most agree that it's best translated as call out, call out assembly, or simply call out. I believe the whole context of how this conversation started, and the way Jesus facilitated this whole discussion will bring us to a renewed understanding, and perhaps a rediscovery of the basic significance of the call of the church. From my reflections on this passage in Matthew chapter 16, here are three points for our consideration. First, the context. Call out from within. The church as the antithesis. Jesus conceptualized the church as an opposite replica of the religious system of his days. Then it was as if the church was an opposite camp that was set up to contrast, compete, and to counter the fallen religious system of his time. The church is not just about a physical congregation. It's first about spiritual consecration. Secondly, the Christ called out to be with the church from the apocalypse. The church was conceptualized based on the divine revelation of who Jesus was, not from uh, a public opinion, but more who he was to the church relationally and personally. As much as we are part of a weekly public worship of God, we need to walk with Jesus in our personal lordship daily. And thirdly, the church call out to become the church in the metamorphosis. The church was set up for a spiritual transformation of all who are set apart for kingdom work and purposes. Our kingdom service has to be in tandem with the, our inner transformation of our hearts. The church is first a spiritual cocoon to bring out God's purpose in his people from the inside out. Let's look at the context of the passage. Jesus spoke about the concept of the church with his disciples after his encounter with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And in this encounter, Jesus refused to respond to the religious leaders on their request for a sign from heaven. While it's apparently it seems to be a legitimate request to authenticate Jesus' identity and mission, Jesus discerned their close-up and hardened hearts of unbelief. 
perhaps they asked this question to trap him rather than a sincere desire to know him. And it was this Jesus warned his disciples on how the lives and the teachings of these religious leaders can infect and corrupt their faith and, and the whole spirituality of sincere seekers. He was repulsed you know, by the empty shows and religious theater of, that these people put up, having a form of godliness, but deny the very heart and purpose of God. And the pious and spiritual ex externals are pushing people away from God instead of drawing them into his kingdom. And it was with this that Jesus pulled his disciples apart and, and, and aside and gave them a stern warning about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was in this context that the conversation uh, of Jesus, the church was brought up. And I believe Jesus brought up and conceived the church, the notion of the church in direct contrast of the fallen religious system of his days. Instead of a religious system that pushed people away from God through additional laws and burdens imposed, the church is meant to draw people to God. And unlike the empty shows and the shells of the Pharisees and Sadducees who are all puffed up by their spiritual inheritance, by, marked by their physical sign of circumcision, the church is primarily called out from within through the circumcision of our hearts. And we, the church, are called into existence when our hearts are firstly set apart for God. While the Pharisees and Sadducees of those days depended on their outward sign of circumcision to boast their religious standing and spiritual credentials, Jesus was calling for an inward consecration of hearts of all who desire to follow him. Jesus was basically reiterating God's mandate since Moses' time. In, verse, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love God, your Lord, with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may be alive. You know, Paul renewed this call in this letter to the churches, bringing to reality the call and provision made possible by the church and by Jesus and the Holy Spirit for the church. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, he says, For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. A story was told about a lovely little girl named Liz who was suffering from a rare, threatening disease. Her only chance of recovery appeared to be a blood transfusion from her five-year-old brother, who had somehow survived the same disease and had now developed the antibodies we needed to combat that illness. The doctor explained the situation to her little brother and asked the little brother if he would be willing to give his blood to his sister. He hesitated for a moment, before taking a deep breath and finally saying, yes, I'll do it if it will save her. And as the transfusion progressed, he lay in the bed next to his sister and smiled, seeing the color returning to her cheeks. Then his face grew pale and his smile faded. He looked up to the doctor and asked with a trembling voice, will I start to die right away? Being young, the little boy had misunderstood the doctor he thought he was going to give his sister all of his blood in order to save her. It's the boy's heart that makes up the whole trust of this story. His heart that was set apart with only one aim, which is to save her sister, even at the expense of his own life. In the church, there was Jesus' response to the religious sin at the time, which was full of spiritual tactics and shows, yet, empty and devoid of God's heart for his people. And what the religious system was in Jesus' day, the church is not to be. That's what I mean by the church as the antithesis. We must be careful not to fall into the whole trap of living as his church based on externalities, spiritual facades, or an outward performance. Yet, with uh, our hearts desiring to impress man more than God, and that was exactly what Jesus called the church not to be. And while the religious leaders of those days turned the house of God upside down and contrary to God's purpose, we, the church, needs to be totally opposite of them from the inside out. And that's the essence of the church being called out 
from within. The full expression of the church come up, comes up from the fullness of a heart being set apart for God. And the abundance flowing out from the church originates from the abundance of a heart consecrated to God. And the church was called out firstly from within uh, uh, through the inward consecration of our hearts. And secondly, the church was called out to be with. It's about sacred and eternal relationship with the revealed Christ. You know, I came from a family of four in Malaysia. We have a mix uh, of the Taoist and Buddhist tradition and were involved in temple and idol worship. And one day, my father was diagnosed with uh, epilepsy or fits. You know, first two years were, was manageable as uh, he took medication as prescribed by the doctors. Then one day he had a major seizure in the office and was hospitalized for six months. And after he was discharged from the hospital, he started to behave strangely. And he started to also suspect there is something spiritual as he started to hear voices. You know, his behavior also took a turn to be more uh, aggressive and threatening. And based on our religi religious background, we went to find monks from Malaysia and from Thailand. But nothing really worked. I remember there was a monk who came into our house and burned incest and smoked the whole place. He rang bells and chanted for hours, but my father's situation remains the same. You know, but something very interesting happened when my father went to stay with a monk in the temple in East Malaysia for about two weeks. At the end of two weeks, the, the, the monk uh, could not help in solving my dad's problem. But he said something very uh, significant to my dad and mom before he they packed their bags to leave the temple. He said, uh, go try Jesus. You know, that was how my parents was led to you know, get help from the church and was eventually saved. To the monk, Jesus was one of the possible solution or keys to solving my dad's uh, predicament. He, he, he know church, uh, he know Jesus uh, as a certain part of Jesus, but you know, he doesn't know what was revealed divinely, who Jesus really uh, was or is to the church. You know, so to us, the church, Jesus is more than just that. that. That's why Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 16. You know, he was well aware what many people were saying about him, but he was more particularly concerned about uh, the, the, he's not really particularly concerned about the various perceptions. But he, he's more concerned what his inner circle of disciples thought of him as it was critical to what he was about to say and how the future of his the mission will unfold. And this conversation was indispensable to make it absolutely clear and without doubts of his true identity. In verse 15, he says, What about you? He asked. What do you say I am? And Simon Peter asked, uh, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. As many of us are very familiar to the passage, Peter, Peter was the first one to identify Jesus as the living Christ, the true Messiah. And it was with this that Jesus, in turn, revealed to Peter who he was and would become. The church was called out to be with Christ as a head and the Lord. Jesus said the church will be built upon such revelation and, and the church is a group of people which are called out from where they are to a place where they acknowledge Jesus as the Savior, Lord, and Master. And this is not a distant notion or impersonal truth. This is based on the essential eternal relationship that is discovered through the saving grace of the gospel. And this is a, a, a relationship that is set apart once a believer is committed by faith to come under the life and lordship of Christ. And this is not only to be confessed and declared, but to live out through the entire life of a believer or follower. The church is called out based on this individual faith relationship set apart and live together. The church is called out firstly not to be a mission or cause but primarily to a person who is our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's upon this foundation of a sacred and an eternal relationship set apart that the church will be built under the hatred of Christ. A pastor put it succinctly in these words, our primary call is not to advance God's kingdom, but to abide in Jesus. You know, Ecclesia is a gathering of believers coming together to be with Jesus. And, and this is where true worship 
happens when all of us come in unison to truly declare uh, Jesus as God and Lord from the bottom and sincerity of our hearts. Songs are just one of the many ways we can express that. They can help to give us words to express. They themselves are empty without our hearts being set apart and being at the right posture to truly acknowledge who God truly is and who He is in relationship in our lives. True worship happens when we receive the Lordship of Christ over our lives and, and respond not just with absolute surrender but with exhilarating praise and joy. And that's what the church is called out for. That's of course not only happens on weekends. This declaration and this revelation and truth happens uh, through our lives, affecting us and shaping us into what God truly desires. And it's when we truly worship, we truly become. It's to acknowledge Jesus as his Lord that Simon, the fisherman, become, became Peter, the apostle of Christ. The exchange between Peter and Jesus was significant. Not just that it leads to Jesus coining the term and purpose of the church, but that it brought about the essential foundation and purpose of which the church was found. You know, the, the church was called to become. In verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You know, in the first breath that Jesus responded to Peter, he addressed him as Simon. In the next breath, he called him Petros. You know, or, or, or this is uh, or Peter. You know, this is a very significant way that God usually call out the destiny of a person through his identity. In, in Genesis 17, Abraham was called Abraham, which means the father of nation. In Genesis 35, verse 10, 11, God changed the name of Jacob to Israel. And in the New Testament, Saul became Paul when God launched, launched this apostle to his calling and mission. We are all called out to become. And the confession of Peter was a crucial turning point in the gospel. Jesus went on to teach about his atoning death and move towards that reality, you know, culminating on the cross. Jesus then became the sacrificial lamb of God. And for Peter, he went on to discover his own failure through his denials of his master, uh, received and restored by Jesus himself at the beach and went on to become the great apostle to the Jews. You know, from Simon to Peter, you know, the church is called out to become. Upon the recognition of Jesus in our lives, we are called to be transformed into God's purpose through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not just some personal wish list of Jesus. This is the reality that he had purchased for the church and for each one of us by his blood and death on the cross. The church is Jesus' enduring legacy. You are Jesus' enduring legacy. And all the power of hell and Hades can do nothing to stop that. You know, a renowned teacher and preacher, Sadhu Sunda Singh, came across a non-Christian on a train to India. He gave the man a copy of the John's Gospel. The man took it, tore it, and threw it out the window. And he said, there, what do you think of that? Well, it so happened that there was a man who was walking along the track that day. And on the railroad track, he noticed a small piece of paper. He took it up and read four words, the bread of life. He did not know what it meant, and he started to inquire among his friends, and one of them said he is out of a Christian book. The man was hungry for the truth, and he wanted to read this uh, uh, a book and, and that contained such beautiful phrases. He purchased a copy of the New Testament and read it eagerly. The light flood, slowly flooded his heart, and he became converted unto Jesus as his Lord. And eventually, he became a preacher of the gospel. This man was called out from within, a seeking and a hungry heart for the truth. And through his reading of the Bible, he then called out uh, to be with Jesus. Through the leading and the work of God's Spirit, he became a preacher of, for God. This dynamics of what happened defines the church. This is Jesus' legacy, that even the power of death cannot stop the church advance, nor claim victory over those who belong to God. 
Jesus clearly said, said in verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You know, it's noteworthy to know that after this point, Jesus became very intentional to teach and share about his suffering and death on the cross. And unknown, his, his, unknown to his disciples, he has begun to unveil his, his will, so-called, you know, uh, death will to his inner circle, just as he was, he was about to commence his journey to the cross to die. You know, the church was what Jesus would leave behind after his tenure here on earth. And it was with this, he headed confidently towards his death, trusting God the Father for his will to be done after he leaves the sea. The church was to be his enduring legacy which Peter, with Peter as one of the pillars. You and I are to be Jesus' enduring legacy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It was not too far back that I went for my sabbatical leave after a busy year in 2019. It was during this period where I managed to slow down, that uh, I began to have a better glimpse of the state and of my heart and faith. And it was in a personal spiritual retreat that I managed to reflect, reflect prayerfully how I was doing. And some may call it a spiritual assessment or appraisal. On hindsight, it was more like a heart checkup for me. You know, I asked these questions, you know, am I a better person after becoming a Christian? Am I a, a better Christian after becoming a pastor? Or, and, and am I a better pastor after becoming a zone leader? You know, at the end of the day, when the dust settled, when the noises uh, fade out, after all that was done and accomplished, what is the outcome of my inner being? You know, the spiritual state of my faith. Am I, am I still carrying on uh, God's testimony to the world through who I am? Am I an uh, infective witness to my friends and loved ones who needs to know God from who I have become? Does my processing of becoming help, to, help me to trust God more or less? Is my inner transformation of my heart in tandem with my ministry contribution? Regretfully, I did not fare that well in my heart checkup. There was areas in my heart and faith that God pointed out clearly that, that it was not doing well. I realized that I've been paying lip service to some of the basic tenets and practice of the Christian faith, and I failed to walk the talk. It was sobering, it was humbling experience, and for all you know, I might need to do a follow-up, a checkup on this, and even, even a heart surgery, like what Jesus did for Peter at the beach after his resurrection in John, John chapter 21. Yes, yet in spite of this, God was gracious. Can you imagine having a boss doing an appraisal with you where you know without a shadow of doubt that you have messed up uh, terribly and failed miserably? Can you visualize your boss somehow forgot to mention all those areas that you have messed up but instead decided to even give you a treat over the appraisal? Uh, it's not that he's pleased with you but that he has the kindest and the most gracious demeanor and words to say to you penetrating as they may be, yet gentle and strong to encourage and to lift you up so that you can grow and improve yourself. That was what happened at the beach between Jesus and Peter days after the resurrection. And that was what happened at my heart checkup appointment. God's goodness and mercy has no end. And there was a recent morning uh, as I was finishing up this message and recounting on the sobering heart checkup incident, my heart was heavy on how little or how the challenge of how I can reflect uh, as Jesus' enduring legacy. And there I too am learning that I can do, try to do things right and yet can be so wrong. And outwardly, it can be pleasing to men, but yet inwardly so displeasing to God. As this reality and burdens continue to weigh in on my heart, I heard a voice. It's not God's audible voice. It was the voice of my daughter, Anna, 
announcing to us all that she was awake in the morning. You know, I went to her room and had a usual wake up conversation with her. And then she started to point her finger up. You know, I asked her, what are you pointing your finger to at? And, I, and are you pointing to Jesus? And then he pointed to the cross figuring on the wall and started to sing, uh, Jesus loves me, yes I know. Right, a, a, a famous uh, children chorus. And at the chorus, she, she replaces me with Papa. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves Papa. Yes, Jesus loves Papa. You know, at that moment, is uh, as if Anna's room became a holy sanctuary in God's presence. Jesus loves the church. This is his enduring legacy born out of the Father's love. It's the legacy of our hearts. We are to be mindful that our physical gathering of the church comes first from the inward consecration of our heart. It's the legacy of an eternal uh, relationship with Jesus as our Lord. We have to be aware that our weekly participation in public worship of God must be an outcome, an outflow of our daily personal walk under the Lordship of Christ. It's a legacy of transformation. Our kingdom contributions must always be an outcome from the inner devotion and transformation of our hearts. And this is a spiritual legacy that you and I are investing upon and have inherited by His grace. Treasure it with all your heart. Steward it well and faithfully throughout our lives. It is with this that I look forward to my next heart checkup. For I know God is diligently working inside of me at all times, even though it can be painful, and can always a humbling experience, yet a necessary part of ensuring that the legacy of His Son lives on in me, in you, here in Cruz, and in millions of His followers worldwide, known as His Church. Amen. <laughs>